Do you enjoy having birds nest on your property? Would you like to learn more about what to look for in a nest box to make it the best it can be for your birds? Are you interested in finding out how you can safely monitor your nesting birds and help scientists study nesting birds? These are just a few of the many topics that we discuss in this episode. Oh, and if the wrens or other birds take over your hanging baskets every year, then be sure to listen all the way to the end of our conversation because our guest shares a great tip that will allow you to continue watering your plant without disturbing the nest. Nature isn't just out there in some far off exotic location. It's all around us, including right outside our doors. Hi, my name is Shannon Tromboli and I am the host of Backyard Ecology. I invite you to join us as we ignite our curiosity and natural wonder, explore our yards and communities, and improve our local pollinator and wildlife habitat. Hi everyone. Before we get started, I want to thank all of my supporters on Patreon. Their monthly donations help make Backyard Ecology possible. If you would like to join them, you can do so for less than the cost of a cup of coffee or a meal at your favorite fast food place. I'll have links in the show notes for the Backyard Ecology Patreon page, blog, YouTube channel, and email list. Today we're talking to Holly Grant. Holly is the project assistant for NestWatch, which is a community science program based out of the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. Hi, Holly. Welcome to Backyard Ecology. Thank you for talking with us today. Hi, Shannon. It's great to hear. I am so excited to have this conversation because I think most of us can agree that it's just fun to watch nesting birds. And let's face it, most of the time when people think about wanting to attract birds to their yards, they do one of two things. They put up a birdhouse or they put up a bird feeder. And there's lots of other things that we can do as well. But we want to kind of concentrate today on nesting birds in general, including putting up the birdhouse or the nest box. But before we get into all of that, can you just tell us a little bit about what you do and how you got interested in birds? Yeah, sure thing. Um, so I work here uh, with NestWatch at the Cornell Lab Ornithology, as you just said, and um, NestWatch, it's a small project in terms of employees, right? There's my project leader and me, um, and we've got a really great tech team behind the scenes. But I uh, basically answer questions that people send to us asking about birds. I can help them with their data entry. Um, you know, a lot of our participants are monitoring the bird nest in their homes and communities, recording data that they see, sending it to us on our website. So it's a little bit of a, you know, IT help on some ends and, uh, you know, biological help on the others. It's just general questions that come through, um, even the Cornell Labs main line, right? They, they'll sometimes get sent to me. So I've learned a lot on the job. <laughs> a lot of it has come from when I really got into birds in uh, college. And I went to SUNY ESF, which is environmental science and forestry here in New York. And um I fell in love with birds taking my first ornithology class. You know, at first I was like, oh, birds are cool. Great. I took this class and now I'm all in. So it's a, it's a really great marriage of my interests. That's very interesting and sounds very familiar. <laughs> um, I, I yeah. think a lot of people, if they're into the birds, like they've gone the ornithology route, it started out a lot of times as like, oh yeah, birds are cool. Birds are interesting. And then you take the ornithology class and it's like, okay, birds are my thing. <laughs> right, right. You get that spark, right? I mean, my mom had always put up feeders on our back deck, right? So um, I was familiar with them. I was, you know, before I knew what keeping a life list was, I was keeping track of how many species came to our feeders. And then, you know, you take this class and you realize, oh, it's not just the four or five, you know, 14 or 15 species that come to your feeders. It's, you know, hundreds that are in the forests and the fields and, um, parks and everything that's around your home too, you know? So first time seeing these little birds that you never knew lived there before, <laughs> and you've been familiar with it for the last 20 years of your life, right? It's, um, it's a, definitely an eye opener. Yes, it is. But that's also a great lead in because talking about all the different types of birds that are out there beyond just what comes up to the bird feeders. I mean, it's the same thing with nesting birds. I mean, all those birds nest somewhere, but they all don't use the kind of typical bluebird style nest box birdhouse that I think most of us think of when we think about putting up a birdhouse or a bird box. I mean, there's so many different places that they nest and types of nesting habitat they use. I mean, from different size cavities to just like the open branches of trees and shrubs, rock ledges, um, straight up on the ground and what doesn't look like 
anything. They just kind of like drop their eggs in a pile and that's it sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, just like birds um, will come to feeders with different types of food, right? Your sunflower seeds might attract different birds than your suet. Um, you know, different birds have different preferences for nesting too. So while you might find bluebirds and swallows and chickadees and wrens in nest boxes or birdhouses, either either word is interchangeable there, um, you know, you're not going to see a hummingbird or a cardinal in a nest box because they prefer to nest in your bushes and your trees. So um, yeah, each species is just a little bit different. But that's really exciting too, because it means that we don't all have to have a place that we can put up a bluebird house because we don't all have that but yet we can all still have those nesting birds either on our properties or nearby our properties. And it's just, I think it's freeing in many ways and exciting to have that. Absolutely. We have a lot of participants who monitor their nest for nest watch and they live, you know, in an apartment in the city or they live, um, you know, in a very suburban area where they might not have a lot of natural space like parks and forests, but they have a small backyard area and, you know, they can put up one box or they can just keep an eye on their their planters of flowers um, out of their back window, right? Maybe you'll find a junco or a, or a morning dove nesting there. Hearing you say juncos nesting just always kind of makes me smile because I mean, you are up in New York, so you can have juncos. For me, down here in Kentucky, they're a winter bird. They're gone long before the nesting season really gets started. Yeah, we are lucky to have some of those birds up here. Um, we're right sort of uh, below the boreal forest, right? So we're, we don't have um, a lot of, a lot of the warblers might nest up there, but we do have a few that, that nest down here in the forest as well. And, um, you know, warblers are those beautiful, pretty birds that I think um are those hidden gems that not a lot of people know about and unless they get into birding, right? But, you know, you're probably not going to find those nests as often as some of the more common birds, but gosh, it is a joy if you're out hiking in the woods and you come across one. It's just that little spark of color is always such a, such a gift. Oh, yes, exactly. Or down by the creeks and the ponds and the lakes with the prothonotary warblers and the Kentucky warblers, if you get lucky enough to find them in the brush. Right. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Perulas, if you can find them up in the tops of the trees, but warblers are a whole different story. And once you fall in love with birds, you'll fall in love with the warblers, but they're also extremely frustrating right. because they like to stay in the tops of the trees and they never stop moving. So once the leaves get on the trees, it's like, uh, yeah, this is going to be fun. Right. There's a very few weeks, a couple of week period where you can see warblers. I think they're, they might be around later than that, but you know, right before the, the leaves come in and, um, you know, after migration has started, which is depending on where you are in the U.S., it can be a pretty short period of time. <laughs> so before we get too far off topic, because I already know both of us could go way off topic and have a lot of fun, have some great conversations, but let's kind of bring it back to the nesting. And so we've mentioned briefly some of the different types of birds that would nest in boxes, but even though they're not, they're not all the same. So let's talk a little bit about some of the different types of nest boxes you can put up or nesting platforms and the types of birds that would use them. Yeah, sure. So um, we have an awesome tool on our website called Right Bird, Right House. Um, it's interactive. People can go on there and they can select their region. Right now we just have U.S. and Canada regions, but someday we hope to include a lot more um, global species in there. Um, for right now, it's just U.S. and Canada. And then you can also select the habitat. So that could be a lakeshore, it could be forest, grassland, residential area, um, a bunch of different choices. And that'll help you, um, it'll come up with a list of different nest structures that you can build for birds. So like you said, there's a bunch of different kinds. Um, your typical nest box that a lot of people are thinking about is ideal for bluebirds, right? That's maybe five by nine inches or so and five inches deep. And it's got that, that typical... Um, inch and a half diameter entrance hole. That's ideal for a lot of species. I think there's, I want to say eight to 10 different common species that'll probably take up that kind of nest box. But you've also got other cavity nesters, which is what we call birds that nest in nest boxes. Um, wood ducks, surprisingly, nest inside nest boxes. They normally build their nests in tree cavities. So that means that they're likely to be attracted to a nest box. Theirs are much taller than the bluebird boxes, of course. It's a bigger bird. Um, their entrance holes are almost, you know, three to four inches in diameter instead. So very different, uh, requires a little bit more wood. Um, we've got nest platforms for osprey, which is basically eh, three by three foot tray that you put on the top of a very tall pole. And um, 
you know, we could even make little uh, phones out of wire mesh that can help you attract a morning dove, or um, if you make a large one, a great horned owl. Um, so those birds aren't necessarily cavity nesters, but it's a structure that can attract those birds to nest in a particular area. So that's kind of our goal is helping create nesting space for species that might not otherwise have it, especially in those more suburban or urbanized areas. Um, another one that I often think about is the Phoebe platforms. So again, it's just a basically a piece of wood that you put somewhere and it's like creating a flat table tray type situation where they can nest on it. Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up because um, I was trying to think of the other kind. <laughs> but nest nest shelves, yes, those are another great one. Eastern Phoebes will use them. Um, and barn swallows are also another species that would use something like that. Or American robins. A lot of people are familiar with robins. Um, they're all uh, would be willing to build a nest on like on a structure like that. Our nest construction plans that are listed on our website have a couple of walls on it. So it's more like um, an open C shape. I think you could describe it as, but even just a flat shelf would work for them as well. Um, one important thing that we like to stress to people is that there's no one best nest box plan. There's a lot of different styles out there for bluebirds. There's a lot of different styles out there for barn owls, for um, you know all these different kinds of species. And um, obviously there's some features that you want to include to make sure that it's the best it can be for birds, right? You want to have ventilation, you want to have um, unpainted, untreated wood so it's safe for the birds inside, but, um, you know, and drainage holes in case it gets rainy. But, um, you know, the specific, you know, four inches versus five inches or, um, you know, little tweaks here and there are not going to make a huge difference in nesting success most of the time. What about the size of the entrance hole? Because I've heard that is really important with some species. Yeah, so entrance hole, um, obviously you want to make sure that it is big enough to fit your target bird. <laughs> um, so if you have, uh, let's just say an eastern bluebird, you want to attract bluebirds, you're not going to want that entrance hole to be smaller than an inch and a half in diameter. Anything smaller and they're not going to be able to fit their shoulders inside. So that's the main concern is just making sure your target bird can fit. Another reason people pay attention to entrance hole sizes is because of invasive species like house sparrows and European starlings. Both of those species are non-native to the U.S. Um, and they do compete for nesting space with our native species. So many monitors want to discourage them from using their nest boxes. So there's certain sizes of entrance hole that you can use to exclude those birds. Now, granted, that's also going to exclude some of your favorites, right? So um, a lot of times you can't exclude house sparrows from eastern bluebird nests because bluebirds are larger than sparrows, right? So we've got a few suggestions on our website about how to specifically deter those birds, um, the invasive birds. But um, overall, you know, like uh, house wrens and black-capped chickadees prefer um, about an inch or an inch and an eighth uh, for their entrance hole. So they're really small birds. They don't mind having a small entrance hole. And that excludes both of those um, invasive species. So if you have a big problem with starlings and sparrows in your area and you don't want them in your nest boxes, try for wrens and try for chickadees. That's probably going to be your best bet. Yes. You can only do so much, but. Right. Right. And, you know, excluding those birds from nesting in your boxes means they're probably just going to go try to find another place nearby. I'm not saying you should uh, encourage them to nest, but, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of them in the U S so it's going to be very hard to eradicate them from one, any one area. <laughs> And it's not all about the artificial nesting locations either. There's also things that you can do to just like encourage natural nesting areas or even if they're not natural areas to just use what's already around. I know around where I'm at, I mean, common to see robin nests in kind of the crook of, of the gutter where it kind of flattens out or like over... Um, over top of the lights on the buildings. Right. And in your porch eaves, there's a lot of places that birds will nest around your house. You're right. Um, and there's a few things with that, right? So you can encourage those birds to nest in your yard if you don't want to put up a nest structure by including native plants in your yard. That includes, that helps um, helps your native insect population. And I know a lot of people are kind of iffy on insects, right? But that's probably 90 to 95% of the diet of most songbird nestlings. So the more insects you have in your yard, the more options that those birds have to help feed their young. So encouraging that that natural area 
um, avoiding using pesticides, you know, anything you can do to make your yard a little bit more wildlife friendly is going to help your birds. But I'll say too, um, having all those birds around your house can be challenging for some people. Either, you know, they don't want the birds swooping at their head, right, when they're trying to defend their nests, or um, you, when you're leaving your house, if you've got a bird's nest right next to your door, you're probably going to be scaring it off its nest, you know, every time you go in and out. So um, those nest shelves and boxes can help attract the birds to a safer place to nest. Um, a lot of times if birds are disturbed too much during their nesting period, then they can abandon the nest and then, you know, that's no good for anybody. So uh, mm -hmm. there's a lot of things to consider, I guess, when you're paying attention to those birds around your house. Yes, exactly. And I mean, I can second the story about the birds nesting in locations that maybe aren't the best for us as people and it's our home. So we have to find a balance because like every year we've got a set of Phoebes that will nest on our front porch because the posts on the front porch are a little bit wider on the inside than where the roof comes down. So they've got this nice little narrow natural ledge. I mean, they nest naturally on rock ledges. So this is kind of the artificial version of that, even though we didn't put it up. So they'll nest either there or they'll nest on the lights on the front porch. And the way our house is set up, everybody goes through the back door. Nobody goes to the front porch or the front door. So we'll just let them nest there. And we end up pulling the, the drapes closed because it's right outside the living room window. So we'll pull the drapes closed earlier in the evening once they start nesting there. And once they get ready to start to fledge, we'll just leave them closed all day so that we're not spooking them off as we move inside the house. We just don't go on the front porch. That's great advice for sure. I think um, the only thing I would have to add to that is if people have pets um, to do their best to keep the pets on a leash, especially during the times when you expect those nests to fledge. Those little fledglings are cute and floppy and they'll hop around. It's just, you know, pets, dogs, cats, they love that kind of thing. So um, if you can help it, try to keep them separated. <laughs> um, but pretty shortly after fledging, the fledglings will generally uh, go hide under a nearby bush or they'll be out of harm's way. But those first couple of hours, it's important to be be careful. Yeah. And then like one of the issues that we see a lot with those Phoebes, I mean, we love them, but they poop a lot. So the whole front porch ends up being poop. Right. <laughs> poop, poop. And, and like, and even when they, before they fledge, like the parents will fly out and they'll, when they fly, they poop and, and, and they'll carry the baby poop out, but there ends up being a lot of bird poop all over the porch. And that's not exactly the best. So we have to clean it off once they're gone and all that good stuff. But eventually we're going to screen in the front porch. And that means we're going to have to put those nesting platforms out and those nesting shelves out. So they'll have someplace else to go, but it is a balancing act there. And every year I'm like, before they come, I'm like, okay, do I really want this to do? Or do I want to discourage them from nesting there? And then they nest. I, I turn my back, they nest. And I mean, it seems like it happens overnight, basically. Right. <laughs> and it's like, okay, yeah, we're going to do this again. Cause it's so much fun to watch them, but. Right. You bring up a good point. And it actually reminds me um, that a lot of folks, right. When spring happens, you are all about trying to do these new projects, right. Maybe screening in your porch, maybe taking care of trees in your yard, that kind of thing. And a lot of times, if you're trying to help those birds who are nesting in your area, you might want to wait until fall for that or do it at the end of the year after the birds have stopped nesting because a lot of birds like um, eastern screech owls, right, even up here in New York, they're starting to pick up their nest locations already. And it's early February, right? So, you know, even other birds like um, morning doves and robins, you know, they start earlier than you think a lot of times. So we've always say, you know, if you've got the option, if you're able to make that decision, if you can wait try to do it in the fall, um, especially those big old trees that can offer a lot of cavity space for nesting birds. Of course, you know, this all hinges on whether it's safe to keep those trees up, right? I understand that some of that is kind of an emergency. <laughs> um, but a lot of times too, if you are taking down big trees, leaving a stump, even if it's only, you know, six to 10 feet tall, that can even, that could be a great uh, help to your local wildlife. Oh, yes. Those snags can be amazing, but again, you've got to be careful with where you leave them. You don't want to leave them where they can fall on something that's a, a house, the garage, right. um, the kids who are playing in the front yard or walking right. down the sidewalk. I mean, there, there's safety issues here we have to take into consideration. Right. Safety is first for sure. Yes. 
but where possible, where safety is not an issue, then you've got a whole different set of opportunities that open up. Right, exactly. If it's um, all about what you have to work with, then if you've got room, we definitely encourage it. Yeah, but you, you kind of brought up a point here. That there's so many different directions we could go here. But one of the things that I think we should probably address right now is you were talking about how everything gets started earlier than we think it does with them starting to check out potential nesting locations. Um, when should we put out a new nesting structure, whether it's a platform or a box or anything like that? Yeah, this is a great question. Perfect world. If you've got the time and the energy and everything ready to go, we usually recommend actually putting them out in the fall. Um, at the end of the summer, after the birds have finished nesting for the year and the ground's still soft, especially in these northern states where we get, you know, some really cold weather in the winter, um, you can install the poles in the ground if you're installing it on a freestanding pole. Um, having the boxes built and just there all winter, um, A, can help them get a little bit weathered, right? So they're not brand spanking new. The wood, it's not that bright brand new wood color, right? It kind of fades gray, which blends in with the background habitat a little bit more. That can really help the box be more camouflaged from predators. And having it over winter gives birds an additional space to roost in when that really cold, harsh weather does hit. They have that whole time period to get used to the box. They find it. They, they're like, okay, we, yeah, it's become part of their natural habitat. So when they really, you know, the hormones kick up in late winter and early spring, and they're starting to have that urge to look for cavities, that box is something they're already aware of, and they might consider a lot faster. Now, saying that, I understand it's spring right now. It's not a bad idea to put one up this time of year. Um, you can definitely put one up, and you might have a bird nesting in a couple of months. Birds are weird. <laughs> they're they're uh, different from each other, even between species, even within a species. One bluebird might act differently than a different bluebird. But the most important thing is if you want to attract a specific species, you just want to make sure that your box is installed before they start looking for nesting places. In general, on our website, that tool that I mentioned that has all of the different nest box plans, we do have information on those species pages that tell you what time period during the year these birds commonly nest. So you can take a look at that and say, okay, bluebirds really start in, you know, maybe March or April. So I want to make sure I have this box installed by February, just to give them a couple of extra weeks to, to get used to it. But if you install it now, you're still going to probably have other birds checking it out as well. Like I said, each box can attract a few different kinds of species. And you might be surprised. We've even found house wrens, right? Those tiny little birds that only need an inch in diameter for their nest box, nesting in wood duck boxes, which have the three to four diameter entrance holes. So, you know, like I say, put it up. You never know what you're going to find. Um, it's always going to be worth it no matter what time of year. But in an ideal world, yes, fall is probably going to be your best bet for attracting a species the following breeding season. Which is something that nobody thinks about because we're all guilty of, okay, it's spring. We want to do this and this and this. And, and so we, we want to do all those things that we're seeing happen now and forgetting that there was all this prep work or prior stuff that should have been done fall, winter type time frame. And this is one of those things that we just never think about. But then again, like you said, it's okay to go ahead and put it out later. And like where I'm at, many of our birds will have two nesting cycles, two to three yes. in some species. So you may not get the early round, but you may get a later round of nesting birds in it. So, I mean, you may still get your bluebirds if you put out the bluebird house. Absolutely. We have bluebird nests that have up to three broods. I think we had one that maybe had four broods one year as well. So there's definitely room later in the season. That's a great point. So what should we be doing for maintenance? Because it's not just put up the box and forget it and leave it there for 10 years, which is what I think a lot of people do. And I know as a kid, that's what I thought you did. I mean, I can't judge because we did that so often. Right. Me too. <laughs> as a kid, um, you know, I definitely learned a lot with this position about what is best for birds. Now, you know, leaving a box up like that for 10 years, it's not necessarily a bad thing, right? But if you want to be doing the best you can for birds, you want to have a maintenance schedule of at least checking on it once a year. Um, that's to clean out old nesting material, give it a once over, make sure there's no, you know, the door is not hanging off or, you know, it's still doing okay. Um, just giving it a little bit of an inspection, 
that no nails have popped so that they're pointing inside so that you can poke the nestlings or something like that. Right, right. Just do, you know, a, a general look over, make sure it's in good working order. Um, and then if you need to replace parts or replace the entire box, you've got it all set. All right, so at least once a year, you want to be cleaning the boxes out. But if you are a participant in Nest Watch, you'll be hopefully checking on that box at least a couple of times a week. Um, we have a code of conduct protocol that helps guide people through the best way to check a nest without disturbing the birds too much, but also giving you a chance to get an idea of what's going on in that nest, right? So checking it every three to four days at most is usually what we recommend and making sure that you're near the nest, you know, looking inside the nest box or, you know, po- you know, poking your head over the edge of the cup nest for only about a minute or so, um, any longer than that or more often than that, then you've got the, you run the risk of the birds abandoning the nest. Uh, but that gives you just enough time to see, all right, how many eggs are there? Have any hatched yet? You can record the date, that kind of thing. Um, we've got a whole bunch of information that folks can record while they're at the nest. The more, the better, obviously, but the safety of the birds is paramount. So if you're noticing the parents getting a little agitated, or maybe they're swooping down at your head, probably best to leave it and then come back in another few days to to collect more data. But for a, for a typical nest, a songbird nest, um, it's usually going to last probably about a month. And that means you visited the nest maybe eight to 10 times. So it's fairly low key, but you know, it depends on how many nests you're checking too. We've got folks who have nest box trails that have got hundreds of boxes on them, right? They've got volunteers to help them check them because there's so many. So those folks are probably going to have a little bit more time investment than someone who might be checking a box in their backyard. Which is exciting to get to watch the watch the nest proceed from the time they start to build it to the time you got eggs, then watching the nestlings. It's really fun to watch. I mean, I think that's one of the best things about having nesting birds is getting to watch the progress if it's the nest is somewhere that you can see it. And then, of course, watching the baby birds bounce around after they fledge for that day or two. But it's always so much fun to do that. But like you said, we want to do it in a manner that's going to be safe for the birds and isn't going to interfere too much there. And it's not just, like you said, in a nest box or a nesting structure. This can be the robin's nest in the dogwood tree that's right outside your bedroom window. Anything like that, you can just watch and be able to record. And that information really is helpful to science as well as just fun for us to watch. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's definitely an eye-opener when you watch a nest for the first time, right? Seeing how tiny those eggs are and how little the nestlings are and how fast they grow over those next two or three weeks. It's really amazing. And, you know, as you are a monitor observing, you know, a bird's nest, a lot of us think, all right, great. I'm going to get to see this nest from start to finish. It's going to be so great. But you have to, you know, I'll just say with a grain of salt, it is nature, right? And so not every nest is going to succeed. And because you're monitoring it, you're going to get that front row seat. So I always like to give people a friendly warning that, hey, right, this is going to be great, but also just be prepared because um, birds have a lot of eggs for a reason, right? They're they're hoping at least some of them succeed. And a lot of times they do. A lot of times they do, but sometimes they don't. So yeah. not to bring it down, but. <laughs> but the predators need to eat too. And that's right. a part of it. Right. But we also want to make sure that we're not we're not artificially making that nest more attractive to the predators either. And that's one of the reasons why you don't go up to the nest as often. One, we don't want to spook the nestlings in there and just, uh, or make the parents abandon the nest. But two, we don't want to leave a scent trail that the predators can follow. Right. So I know like when I did duck nesting work way back when, um, we always took a different path to yes. the nest because we didn't want to have one straight path that said, hmm, every fox in the county or every skunk in the county here, follow me. Right. You don't want to leave a dead end trail to the nest. Um, like you say, walking to the nest from one path and leaving via another is um, what we recommend in our code of conduct. So one of the many ways that you can do your best to help give the birds the best chance they can, you know, sometimes nature is going to happen, but our job is to reduce our influence as much as possible. Now, what about predator exclusion? I mean, we're going to have predation. Predation is part of the process. We're creating these miniature ecosystems. Ecosystems have predators. The birds are predators. They're eating all the caterpillars and insects that are coming to the native plants that we're planting because baby birds need food. And the birds have their own set of predators. 
But are there things that we can do to, especially with our artificial nest boxes that we're putting out, to maybe, again, make it not quite so attractive to the predators, give the birds a little extra edge? Yes, absolutely. There's a lot of different things you can do to your box. Um, they're known as predator guards um, or baffles. Uh, some of them are baffles. Some of, There's a couple other um, versions of predator guards that you can get at probably your local bird store or uh, garden store often have them because it's very similar to the ones you might use for a feeder, right? A cone, a metal cone baffle um, is a good option if you've got a nest box mounted on a pole. There's another baffle called a stovepipe baffle. So it's more of like a cylinder that you put on that pole. It just makes it harder for climbing predators to get past and get up to that box, like snakes, uh, raccoons, even little rodents like squirrels and mice and chipmunks. Chipmunks are a surprising nest predator. <laughs> um, so those are two really popular models. There's also something called a Noel guard, which is basically wire mesh in a square or circle shape around the entrance hole. So it gives the birds um, a little bit of like a, like a cage to go through. So that gives them a chance to look at their surroundings before they fly right out in the open. And that can really help if you've got flying predators like um, hawks or you know even corvids like crows and jays that like to perch right at the entrance hole, stick their head inside and try to find something, right? If you've got that mesh that's kind of restricting their access to the hole, that can definitely help. Yeah, those are all helpful. And I hadn't thought about the Noel guards, but yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, most of the ones I've always seen are the cones or the stovepipe ones. Right. And you can buy um, entrance hole extenders as well, which is basically, it makes your entrance hole a little bit deeper. It's something you attach to the front of your nest box. Um, and again, that helps prevent uh, animals, birds that want to reach into the box from reaching too far. So a lot of, you know, you're not going to prevent every single predator from accessing your box, but these can be great deterrents for the birds that might, or birds, snakes, uh, mammals, anything that's in your area. Um, this will be just one more barrier for them to get past. Yeah. Which, I mean, I guess we should say, I mean, we might be putting these up for the birds, but flying squirrels like wood duck nest boxes and flying squirrels like a lot of other smaller boxes too. I mean, you can get some surprising non-bird animals in there that, again, could be an interesting surprise when you open up the box to see what's there, but it keeps it fun. It keeps it interesting. Right. Always a good idea to have a pair of gloves on when you're opening those nest boxes, just in case you've got a squirrel or a mouse that's right there when you, when you're opening that door. Or a snake. I mean, let's face it. True. At least down here where I'm at, we've got a lot of rat snakes and rat snakes will end up in the nest boxes sometimes. They are nest predators. Yes, definitely a popular predator. We do have another recommendation for folks that have boxes on trees. Someone recently published a paper and said they had luck with flexible plastic. If you duct tape that around the base of the tree and that tree is, you know, farther away from other trees in the area, it's probably not going to work in a forest, right? Because things can jump from branch to branch. But if you are um, mounting a box on a tree and you've got that plastic barrier on the bottom, that can help climbing predators like snakes and raccoons from accessing it as well. Um, unfortunately, there's not a lot we can do for cup nests, you know, they're in a tree or they're somewhere that's just going to be really accessible. So the best thing to do there is just give them space and try to check them, like we say, one to two times a week, just give them space and try not to draw attention to the nest and they'll usually be okay. Right. So talking about putting things on the nest boxes, what about a perch? Do nest boxes need perch? It's a question that I get all the time. And yes. uh, so I'll let you take that one. Yeah, it's a super common, uh, common thing, right? We all see those drawings of birdhouses or picture and they, they always got a perch on them. That's actually not great for the birds inside, right? That perch is going to give predators just a little bit extra leverage to get inside the box. You know, like, let's say a blue jay lands on that. They're going to land on the perch and use that to stick their head, you know, give them the leverage to get, to get in there and reach farther than they would have if they didn't have it, right? They, otherwise, they'd be fluttering right there at the edge, the entrance hole. So perches are usually a, a no-no. <laughs> we don't want to include them. Um, and on that note, too, with deterring predators, we also recommend keeping your boxes plain. So not painting them bright colors, which I know, I mean, I was a kid and I loved painting a nest box, right? Like making it pretty and make, putting the flowers and everything on it. But um, if you actually install that box, right, that's going to be a little bit, it's going to look different than its surroundings. And some predators can 
tell those differences, especially the really smart ones. Those crows and blue jays can can really figure stuff out pretty quickly. So if they see something brightly colored, they might say, hmm, that's different. I'm going to go. I'm curious. I'm going to go check it out. And then there you go. They found your eggs and nestlings. So we've kind of mentioned Project Nest Watch and wove it in here in and out, but let's make sure we talk about that a little bit more. Um, who all can get involved with it? Great. Yeah. So Nest Watch is, um, we can actually take a nest record from anywhere in the world. So if you find a nest, um, all you have to do is basically tell us where it is and then give us a little bit of information on it. And anybody can be a part of Nest Watch as well. So it's not just, you know, scientists or people who are super into birds. The whole point is that we want to make it accessible to everybody. Um, granted, if you do have small kids, you probably want an adult supervisor just because we're, you know, we're very careful about um, keeping those birds safe from wandering hands, let's say. <laughs> but um yeah, uh, it's super open to anybody. It's free. Um, all you need to do is create an account on our website. And then we've got lots of help articles that help guide folks through how to enter data for a nest. We ask all of our participants to take a really quick, easy quiz. That's all of the code of conduct information that I've mentioned earlier that walks you through how to safely monitor a nest. Um, and goes over the Migratory Bird Treaty Act, which talks about how bird nests are federally protected as well. So we try our best to avoid handling or touching the nests and their contents while they're active. And I mean, when you talk about how anybody can do it, really anybody can do it. I mean, I know people who have done it with their grandkids. I know teachers who have done it with their students, um, especially some of those early nesting species. I mean, school kind of gets out by the time the big nesting season gets started, but they'll deal with some of the earlier nesting species. I know camps that have done it with their campers. I know many people who have done it with just the birds in their backyard. So really, like you said, anybody can be a part of this and it's so much fun to do. Right. And I alluded to this earlier when I was talking about how much time requirement there is, right? Time investment. And, you know, at most we want people to check one to two times a week, but you could check just once a week. We want folks to be able to check often enough so that they can collect good data, but not so far apart that we can't really tell what happened, right? So once the eggs hatch, a lot of songbirds only need about two weeks and then those young are fledged, right? So if you check once every two weeks, you might miss an entire brooding period. And during which, you know, you might not be able to tell after they're gone whether a predator ate them or whether they successfully fledged, right? So we do want them to be checked fairly often. But on that note, we also take partial data, right? So maybe you found a nest on vacation and you're not going to be there for a month, right? Um, that would be nice, but <laughs> yes, <laughs> um, you know, you can still record that nest and nest watch. You can report maybe your one nest check or maybe two if you're there long enough. Just give us partial data. Maybe the nest hasn't finished yet and you're not able to finish recording it. We've got options for you to report that, right? So nest fate, the the outcome of the nest, whether it's success or fail, we've also got unknown options. You can say, oh, you know, I wasn't able to check this. Um, so I don't know how it ended up. Or, you know, maybe you found the nest and the young were already just about ready to fledge, right? You might only be able to enter one or two nest checks before they're gone. That's all okay. And the point is that these little bits of data are going to be important to researchers doing different projects, right? Mm -hmm. So that's another big part of NestWatch is that all of this data that you submit on our website goes to a database. And this database right now has over 500,000 Nest records. And that's available to researchers who are doing, you know, they're working on learning more about breeding behavior in birds. So maybe one researcher is looking at clutch size, right? So how many eggs are in the nest? And so all of the records that have the number of eggs are going to be part of that study, maybe. But another scientist who is looking at fledglings or maybe the activity of the adult when you're visiting the nest, you know, maybe they're flying around, maybe they're not seen, that kind of thing, um, is going to use nests with that data in it. So if, you know, not every nest may have both of those data points, so different data can be useful to different projects. So all of that to say that no matter what you enter on there, it's going to be valuable to somebody. And that's one of the things I love about Nest Watch and other community science projects is that the data is actually used. I mean, we're contributing to that greater scientific knowledge and learning more about these animals that we all love. And so I really love that aspect of being able to contribute and seeing it 
used. Absolutely. Kind of doing the flip of what you were saying of you can only get a piece because you're on vacation, you find this and you're only there for a week. So you get a piece of the data. What about if the nest is like an open cup nest or like my Phoebe nest? So it's a platform nest and it's somewhere that you're not walking up to it. You're looking out the window type deal, but you can look at it literally 20 times a day <laughs> type thing. Uh, because that is a decent occurrence. It happens to lots of people where you've got those opportunities to do it. Could you do it more often if it's safe for the birds and you're not messing things up for the birds? Because obviously we want to make sure that we're not overly disturbing the nest. Right. We get this question a lot from people who have nest cameras that are trained on nests. So some people yeah. put a camera inside their nest box or maybe trained on an osprey nest. I'm sure you know, a lot of your listeners may have seen some of those live cams that um, are out there, right? The short answer is yes, you can. You know, if you have the energy and the the interest, you can do that, but you don't need to. For Nest Watch data, we don't need a daily account. You know, every couple of days is going to be just as useful and you don't have to expend that energy. So I would say that you don't need to, but if it's something that you're really, really passionate about, you're welcome to do so. There's room to do so. We just make sure, we just ask you that if you're going to look at it, just report just once a day. We don't need, you know, five for the same day. <laughs> There's such a thing as too much data. <laughs> you don't want a minute by minute account. <laughs> right. <laughs> I would say if you're watching it all day, try to include the most important information in that, that one record for the day. Right. So um, a snapshot of what's happening is all we really need to, to get the data that's, that's valuable out of that. And that's why we say every three to four days, right? Because it's going to be pretty pretty much the same for a couple of days in a row. So every three to four days is when it starts to really shift and change into something different, right? The nestlings are going to be probably naked when they hatch. And then three to four days later, they're going to be partially feathered. And three to four days later, they'll be mostly feathered. So you can start to see a better disparity between those checks compared to yesterday versus today. Yeah. And that's an important point. And plus the every few days, I mean, that also works for if you've got a nest box or a nesting structure, something that you have to walk up to, because again, you walk that path, even if you're walking by it and you're not doing a dead end to the nest, the more you walk that path, the more scent you're leaving, the more likely you're going to be to draw predators to it. If you're opening up a nest box, peeking in a cavity, you're disturbing the nest and the parents. I mean, they're not going to smell you. Birds for the most part, especially our songbirds, they can't smell. But you are leaving scent for other things or you're just disturbing the parents by being there. Right. When in doubt, wait a couple of days. The, again, the birds are important, more important than it is to have the data. But again, don't beat yourself up if you're doing everything right and then you find your nest predated. It happens. This is a natural part of the ecosystem. Right. Like you said, you do the best you can right. not to add to it. A lot of folks, right, they'll do everything they can, all the right things you've got, you've checked off every box, and they still don't have successes. And sometimes the birds, you know, you might have a installed a nest box in the right habitat, it's the right size, everything's perfect, and the birds don't come, right? We can't control nature, but we try to provide what we can to give them the option. Yeah. So are there other questions that you get asked a lot? Yeah, actually, one of the biggest ones is regarding baby birds. And maybe this is something that you're familiar with as well. But I think one of the number one questions is, I found a baby bird. What do I do? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. So um, we have some really great help articles on our website and the Cornell Labs main website called um, allaboutbirds.org. That's got a whole bunch of wonderful help articles. But um, in short for this one, the first thing we ask folks to look at is whether the bird is naked, um, has some bare patches on it, right? Or if it's fully feathered. Something that not a lot of people know is that birds, when they first fledge the nest, they can't fly very well. <laughs> they're not immediately taken to flight and flying strongly over to the you know nearby trees. They're going to be falling around. They're going to look helpless. You know, they look like toddlers, basically. Yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> and it's so much fun to watch them too, kind of flutter fly and then like, grasp onto some sort of like vegetation or something and then just kind of a lot of times if it's grass or something they just kind of slowly tilt and then they're like oh do I keep hanging on or do I fly <laughs> right it's really fun to watch that so the part of that right is there's there's kind of the helpless nestlings they're not moving around much they might have some bare patches and then there's these very rambunctious and um kind of clumsy 
fledglings, right? The clumsy fledglings, they don't need your help. Their parents are probably nearby. They're, all they're doing is um, trying to find some cover, maybe over some nearby bushes, but their parents are nearby hunting for food and they're going to come back and forth several times to feed those birds and, you know, teach them how to find their own food, teach them how to fly more strongly. And that's, you know, it varies for each species, but they're going to be with their parents for probably at least another week to another month. You know, some of the larger raptors, that's even longer, but most of your songbirds, the fledglings, they're going to look helpless, but they're okay. But if you find a bird that actually does have those bare patches, it doesn't look like it's finished its growing period, right? Those are the ones that probably do need help. A lot of times, if you know the nest is right nearby, you can just quickly pick it up and put it in the nest and just make sure, you know, maybe keep an eye on it from a good distance just to make sure that the, the adults are coming back to the nest. Because sometimes the reason you might find an, a nestling like that outside of the nest is because of a predator. So just kind of keeping an eye on it from a distance, make sure mom's coming back and um, things will probably be okay. But anything more than that, if you think it's injured, if it keeps jumping out of the nest, then that's time to call a wildlife rehabilitator who is someone who is specially trained, has the proper permits and everything to advise you on how to proceed. And that's something that, you know, kind of goes for any time you find a bird in trouble, right? It, it's injured. It's some, you know, we know that there's a huge impulse to bring that bird into your own house. You want to pick it up. You want to hold it. You want to feed it tuna, but that's not going to be what's best for the bird. So the best thing before you even touch it, before you even take any steps, right? Call your wildlife rehabilitator. The wildlife rehabilitator is going to give you the best advice for how to proceed. And then um, you can go from there and they've got the permits, like I say, and the expertise to, to guide you. Definitely. You don't want to be going and picking up any animal. I don't care if it's got feathers or fur or what. Don't try and pick it up and bring it in. I know a lot of people do that and they're doing it from the best of intentions with the biggest heart, but sometimes that's a death sentence. I mean, you hate to say it like that, but it is. And I think if we don't say it and just recognize it, it's too easy to rationalize. And no, we got to stop, think for a second, figure out what's best for the animal. Right. That usually isn't bringing it inside. Right. And that's especially true with folks who want to raise birds from the egg as well. Um, the important thing to know is that birds have a very specific diet, right? And they need specific nutrients, specific vitamins to grow as fast as they do and as strongly as they do. And um, even in natural situations, if they don't get the right combination of things, they can have deformities, they can have a hard time, you know, developing. So it's best to leave that to the birds. Because even if you know, let's say in the best case scenario, someone magically managed to get a bird from egg to fledging stage, right? How are they going to learn to fly from you? What are you going to do after that, right? You you can't teach a bird how to do bird things. So um, it's best to just let the adults do what they need to do and hope for the best. Right. Or even singing, right? I mean, we don't think about it, but birds learn their songs from each other. Sometimes it's from the parents, sometimes it's from neighboring birds, Song development and song learning is a whole different topic. But just like how young humans have a huge amount of stuff they learn in their first few years, same with birds, right? There's some things they're only going to be able to learn from a natural environment. Exactly. So other questions. So another thing that we get questions about sometimes, it's kind of fun and I don't blame these people at all, but you know, you go into a craft store and you might see these tiny little bird houses. We've got folks who might ask, you know, oh, what kind of bird lives in here? And the answer is none, <laughs> right? A tiny little birdhouse that has, it's maybe four inches tall. It's very cute. It's decorative, but no birds will nest in there. One of the popular suggestions is a hummingbird. Um, hummingbirds are not cavity nesters, <laughs> but if you look really carefully into the forest, um, usually on tree branches, you might see something very small and lichen covered, and that might be a hummingbird nest, right? It's sometimes as small as a ping pong ball. So they're pretty hard to spot, but if you happen to find a hummingbird and you follow it with your eyes through the branches, you might just see it land on its nest. They're the coolest things to see. They're so small and the eggs are about the size of Tic Tacs, little breath mints. <laughs> <laughs> it's so adorable. But yes, they nest on a branch. <laughs> yeah, I'm always jealous of the people who post pictures or have videos of seeing a hummingbird nest because I'm like, I I've never been able to... now. I've had hummingbirds. I know exactly which tree they're in, but I have never found the nest or been able to see the nest because they're so oh. tiny. Birds are so good at camouflaging their nests, right? I mean, one of these, it's, it's one of the things that makes them 
uh, so successful in the wild to begin with, right? So birds will fly all around, right? You see them flitting from branch to branch to that tree, to this tree. You know, they don't have one home. The nest, even birds that nest in nest boxes, right? They're not spending the whole year there. They're just spending their breeding season, um, part of their breeding season in that box. So having um, camouflage and making, you know, finding a way to hide themselves while they have to stay in place for that short amount of time um, is really important because they want to be able to get through that whole four week, five week period without being noticed by a predator. So they are doing everything they can to make sure they are not being noticed by anybody else, right? They want to be camouflaged. They're only going to visit the nest once a day to lay their egg and then they're going to fly away, right? Until all of those eggs are laid, then they start incubating all of those eggs and they're still as possible. They're not making any sound. A couple of birds sing while they're incubating, but most of them are still and quiet, right? They're doing everything they can to reduce anybody else from noticing them. So it makes sense that, you know, you might be able to be really, really close, but you can't get that final, (laughs) that final pinpoint of where the nest is in the tree because the birds don't want you to. (laughs) Exactly. Um, And on that note too, this uh, conversation has made me think of another myth that we typically bust for people. Birds only lay one egg per day maybe one every two days if they're a larger bird. But um, I've definitely had folks ask me if a bird that's all big and puffed up is pregnant, (laughs) which again, I can't blame, can't blame folks for not knowing. Um, But yeah, it takes usually for a typical songbird, it takes about 18 hours for an egg to form in their oviduct and then to be laid in a nest, right? So um, let's take a bluebird. It's a common species. They have a I think they usually have four to six eggs in their clutch. So that's going to take four to six days for that nest clutch to be laid. And then after that final egg is laid, then they start sitting for the two or three weeks that it takes to incubate them. And then another two to three weeks when the young hatch and start getting louder and drawing more attention to the nest as they beg for the food from their parents. Or parent, because not all, we we tend to say parents, but not all species of birds have both parents involved in raising the young. Many of them, it's just the female that's involved with that aspect of it. That's true. And even birds that might have both parents tending to the first brood, if they have another brood, sometimes one parent's off, you know, helping the the new fledglings get used to the world while the um, female might be back starting a second nest. (laughs) So yeah, you're right. It's not always two birds, but um, I think it sure does make it easier on them, right? If you've going back and forth every 20 minutes, trying to find food for your hungry, hungry nestlings. (laughs) I would think so. Yes. (laughs) But then again, I mean, having all that food available and having it available nearby is why it's really important to have those native plants that are going to attract the insects to have that, have those food sources there for them. I mean, even if you can't put up a nest box, you might be able to do something else as far as providing food, even if it's a planter on the middle of the patio on an apartment building or something. Right, exactly. And this is a great segue into providing nest materials for birds. A lot of folks love to put out something for uh, birds who are building their nest. Um, And we do have a really nice article that kind of goes into details on what's really good to provide for birds and what's bad to provide for birds. So I'll try to just like say it concisely here. But in general, the best thing you're going to provide is what they can already find in nature, right? Twigs, untreated grass clippings, you know, plant fibers, like from cattails, um, you know, anything that is not chemically treated and something you can already find moss, even dried moss is a good option as well for chickadees, especially Um, gathering that in one spot can um, definitely be a help to those birds. But we also don't want to put out something like dryer lint, which I know is really, really popular. (laughs) Um, The chemicals and detergents that are in there are usually just not recommended to have close to those delicate nestlings in their their nest box. And then um, pet fur is another one that we kind of don't recommend mainly for two reasons. One, again, there's a lot of chemicals that can go on pets, right? So flea treatments, tick treatments, shampoos, you know, there's a lot of stuff that can go in there. So you want to be careful of that. And then the length of that fur and hair as well. So long things like, you know, a couple of inches long Uh, dog fur or yarn or string, right? Those are really popular things that folks put out, but you want to be careful because we've had some reports of birds that have incorporated those things into their nest and then it wraps around the foot of the nestling and then that nestling can't fledge, right? So 
you know, some birds are probably going to use materials like that anyways, but the less that we provide for them is, you know, lessens the chance that that something like that's going to happen. Yeah. So that's probably the, your best bet is going to be provide those natural items and avoid the acrylic yarn and the, the lint and other um, more commercially found products. Or even like you said, the dog hair or the pet hair, which, I mean, you might think it's natural. It's, it's animal hair, but it, again, it's different lengths, different chemicals. I don't know if there's been any research on this or anything, but I would almost question the smell of the animal itself. And again, that attracting the predators to the nest potentially. That's a good point. Yeah. Some birds um, like chickadees and titmice and nuthatches, they're all cavity nesting birds. They build their nests with a lot of moss, but a lot of animal fur in some cases and plant fibers, right? So it's a lot of cattail. I've definitely seen videos of chickadees going up to raccoons and plucking (laughs) hair as they um, climb a tree, right? Um, So you're right. You know, it's, it's, it's definitely... It's definitely something that the birds will use, and it probably depends on the amount they have, but you're right, the scent um, could definitely influence that as well. Not so much for the birds, but like you said, for the predators who might be hunting for a nice tasty snack. Yeah, I mean, there's just all these different questions and stuff. So right, I like what you said about the more natural and the more that they can find on their own, as far as having, having it out there so that they can pick and choose the natural things. Right as much as possible is always the best bet. Right. And like you said, um, you know, we might not have a lot of solid data on what is definitely good for the birds versus what is definitely bad. But, you know, thinking about some of these different relationships, thinking about how, um, you know, just spending a little bit more time thinking about the impact of what you're going to be providing for the birds is always a good idea. And in general, without solid evidence, we tend to shy away from some of those recommendations that, that might invite some dangerous behavior from other animals, right? We want to be doing the best we can for birds. And sometimes that means erring on the safe side. Exactly. So yeah, all of this is really good information. Um, But as we're kind of talking about predators and finding the nest boxes, what would you suggest, or do you guys have any suggestions for if you find like cowbird eggs in the nest box, or if you find house finches using them, because different places have different recommendations. And I know this is a touchy subject for some people, but it is an important one, I think, to discuss and to think about and what those implications are on all sides. Yeah, absolutely. So these brown-headed cowbirds will are a, a bird that's known as a brood parasite. So that means that they don't build a nest themselves. They lay their eggs in other birds' nests. And then those other birds take care of the young as they grow and fledge and go off to do it all over again, basically. So a lot of people, as you might expect, have a bit of a negative opinion of those cowbirds. I think they get kind of a bad rap, right? They're native species to North America. This is just how they reproduce It's not something that they are necessarily choosing to do, right? It's something that they have to do to survive. So um, when you find a cowbird egg in your bird's nest, the best thing to do is to leave it be. Unfortunately, this might mean that that young outcompetes the the host young, right? So that can be kind of a sad outcome for the host young, but it is a native bird. It's protected by the federal laws, and it's best to just let nature continue as intended to be. It's sad, but... The cowbird's got to live too, right? <laughs> Nature isn't all soft and fuzzy and cute and cuddly all the time. Right. And it is really fascinating just to see that cowbird, you know, that's going to hatch a little bit faster than the other eggs. It's going to grow a little bit faster. So it is kind of cool to see this, um, you know, the biology behind it as well. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's another bird that kind of gets a bad rap too called the house wren. Um, and house wrens will often get in the bad graces of people because they go into nest boxes that are already occupied by another bird and they might poke holes in the eggs. Um, maybe they start building a nest right on top of the nest, the nest that was already there. So they're taking over these nest boxes. And then in some cases, they don't even finish those nests, right? Because house wrens tend to build several different nests and they pick one to finish. So understandably, you know, if you've got bluebirds in your box and then a house wren overtakes that box, that's kind of disappointing, right? (laughs) Um, Again, these are native species, so there's not a lot you can do with it in the moment. But one important thing to consider is that house wrens prefer nesting in like shrubby habitat, right in the edge of a forest in the beginning of a field, you know, kind of right on the edge of two different habitats. So if your box is located there, once the, the nest is done and over with, it's not active anymore, there's no eggs or nestlings inside, you can move the nest box more into the open area or more into the forest. 
or you can try installing another box nearby, which can help just provide one more space, right, for birds to nest. So reducing that competition for the nesting space. So there's definitely ways around, you know, trying to discourage some of these less um, less desired outcomes in your nest boxes while still letting those native species continue to, um, you know, live and breed and do what they need to do. Because like you said, they are native species. So they are part of it and there are laws. I mean, if we want to go that direction, there are laws that say you can't kill them or do anything like that. So that's another thing is that we're all trying to do this because we want to do it and we want to take care of the critters and everything like that. But there are also legal ramifications for some of the things as well. Right. And, you know, we've all got our favorite species that we really want to see succeed, but the world doesn't go around just because of our Eastern bluebirds, even though I know some folks who would disagree with me, but <laughs> um, in the best way, right. But um, there's a reason we've got things like keystone species and other animals that, you know, it takes teamwork to really make the ecosystem work in the best ways. So helping all of the species in your yard is definitely a great step forward there. Definitely. And I mean, Carolina wrens are my favorite. Oh, those are the coolest birds, right? They're so flexible in where they nest. We've had reports of them nesting in um, boots that were left outside, you know, someone's hanging <laughs> trousers that were on the clothesline. I mean, it is amazing how crazy their nesting situations are sometimes. You just think, what got into you? <laughs> yeah, exactly. I've heard so many stories like that too and found them in just the weirdest places. At mom's house, you can just about guarantee that any hanging plant that she hangs out, as soon as she hangs it out, Carolina ran nest in it. Mm -hmm. And then she's like trying to water it without watering the nest. Well, a great solution for that is if you've ever seen those glass bulbs that you can buy in like a garden store, right? So it's like, a circular sphere with a long tube attached to it. You can fill those with water, stick them in your planters, and that delivers the water directly to the root of the plant. And then it lets the birds still, you know, have that dry space that's on top of the soil. So that's one of the the little tips that we give folks who come to us with that kind of problem, right? They're like, I just bought these beautiful flowers and now I can't water them. It's like, yes, but <laughs> try this and see if it'll work because, you know, you don't want to flood that nest with water, but you want those pretty flowers to stay and give the birds cover too. And that's a great tip too, because I actually applaud everybody who's like, well, I, what, what do I do? Do I let my plant die? Do, and having that, having that discussion with themselves and trying to figure out, and then going to people and asking, okay, what do I do? Because really they are trying to figure out the best route and taking into account their new bird neighbors. Absolutely. Yeah. We're so happy to get questions from folks because that means that they're, you know, they're trying to do the right thing. And even if they might, it might be a silly question to them. It's never a silly question to us, right? Because we're helping folks really that are the most passionate about these questions, right? They're trying to do the right thing. So we're more than happy to answer people's questions. And that's why we have this helpline, right? Anybody can email us with a nesting question. We're more than happy to, to help them out. Yeah. Because nobody's born knowing everything. Right. Or knowing anything, we all have to learn everything that we know. So we've all asked the stupid questions ourselves and have had those had those moments of confusion and conflict. Absolutely. I did that once I asked a question about squirrels to a one of our local magazines and I got the answer and I was like, oh, yeah, I should have known that. But no, right. It's it's a learning moment for everybody. So. <laughs> Yes. And sometimes it's just having somebody say something in a different way that makes that connection that just makes you go, oh, well, yeah, I should have put that together. Why well, didn't, but I didn't. And it's just having that little light switch moment. Yep. Helps you learn better for next time, right? Yeah, exactly. Well, this has been really, really interesting. So thank you so, so much. And I will definitely have links in the show notes to all the different resources we've talked about, which you've given some amazing ones that I really encourage people to go and take a look at. I'll also put the email address for the helpline so that people can email with questions and continue to learn more. Great. Thank you. This has been a lot of fun and I'm uh, definitely glad to share my knowledge with anybody who asks. <laughs> that is wonderful. So yes, thanks again and have a great day. Thanks. You too. All right. Thanks. Bye-bye. I appreciate Holly taking the time to talk with us. I have a feeling a lot of people are going to be trying out her tip for watering hanging baskets this summer without disturbing the nest. Nestwatch really is a great source of information for all things related to nesting birds. 
There are links in the show notes to some of the resources, but there's even more on their website if you want to explore it. And if contributing to the broader understanding of nesting birds is something that you are interested in doing, then please sign up and participate in the community science portion of NestWatch. It's free, doesn't take much time, and the value of the data set grows with every nest observation that is submitted. I also wanted to let you know that Anthony and I are working on a project that we are very excited about. We're hoping to make an announcement about it in the next couple of months. If you want to be among the first to hear about it, then be sure to subscribe to our Backyard Ecology emails. You can do so at www.backyardecology.net slash subscribe. That'll keep you up to date with everything going on in the backyard ecology world. And when you sign up for our emails, you'll also be able to download a free ebook that explains why our familiar gardening zones don't really mean anything when it comes to gardening with native plants. That's just our way of saying thank you for your interest in backyard ecology. And until next week, I encourage you to take some time to enjoy the nature in your own yard and community.